Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Federal Coronavirus Relief Bills. What do they mean for nonprofits? At this time, let me turn things over to Tim Delaney, President and CEO of the National Council of Nonprofits. Tim? Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. And I uh, really appreciate everybody who's taken the time to join us today. Uh, we have more than 10,000 uh, people. Uh, actually, not more than. We're just at 10,000 because that's the maximum for the platform. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and aloha, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, please know that um, the uh, screen in front of you is showing that uh, with this sunrise, we're trying to shine light on the darkness of uh, the uh, legislation that's passed and trying to figure out what it means for nonprofits. Uh, so uh, with that, Rick, um, next slide. And want to thank our friends at Zoom for um, making this available to you. We have, um, as I said, 10,000 people registered. Uh, we're delighted that Zoom has been able to help the nonprofit community by making this line available for free so that everybody uh, could participate and learn. You'll see on the screen the uh, network map of the National Council of Nonprofits. Uh, we, as you see, go coast to coast and border to border. Um, we are one network uh, connecting uh, a lot of networks uh, across the country, um, primarily through our state associations of nonprofits uh, that are then connecting uh, to their networks of nonprofits across their states. We uh, work uh, trying to help all nonprofits, uh, and the work we do benefits all 501c3 organizations, charitable, philanthropic, and religious. Yet we focus primarily on small to mid sized nonprofits. The 97% of nonprofits in the United States have revenue of less than $5 million a year, 92% under 1 million. Uh, so these are the organizations that are serving real people in local communities helping uh, folks meet their needs. Uh, but please don't be disguised by the small size of individual organizations. Collectively, uh, when you look at uh, the charitable nonprofit sector as a whole, we employ uh, the third largest workforce in the United States. We are larger than the finance industry. Collectively, we are larger than the construction industry. And indeed, we're even larger than the manufacturing sector. And yet, uh, we too often are overlooked because people think we're just small. We may be small, but collectively, we are mighty. Now, I'd like to turn things over to our mighty board chair, um, Donna Murray Brown, who uh, chairs the National Council of Nonprofits uh, Board of Directors. Um, Donna? Thank you, Tom. Welcome and good afternoon, leaders. Again, my name is Donna Marie Brown. I am the chair of the board for the National Council of Nonprofits, and I lead as president and CEO of Michigan Nonprofit Association. I'd like to open quickly with a few words inspired by a quote I read by Yvonne Pierre. I think it's really befitting for a time such as this. Use what we are going through as fuel. Believe in the strength of our sector and continue to be unstoppable. Our sector and certainly our network has always been unstoppable. We remain a formidable community responding to the COVID-19 crisis by remaining true to serving others and as advocates. We have been a strong network for years and it's the strength of our network that has positioned us to serve our communities over the years and right now during the time of this overwhelming need. I am proud of the State Association Network and proud to be a member of the network. I have seen firsthand how we work together, sharing resources and uplifting one another in meaningful and creative ways. Some of the calls, some people on the call may not yet know that our network of state associations serves nonprofits across the country and is held together as one by the National Council of Nonprofits. Most people never see the flurry of communications flying around our network across six different time zones at all hours, and dare I say, all hours of the day 
and night, sharing and exchanging information so nonprofits have what they need to do their best work. If you are a nonprofit and not yet a member of your state association of nonprofits, join today so you can have access to information and add your voice to the collective good. If you're a funder on the call, please make sure you are supporting the state association of nonprofits in your state. Today's webinar was made available at no charge as a matter of equity. So all nonprofits, no matter size nor circumstance, could get the information they need to serve their communities at a time when information and sense making of complex legislation is priceless. I encourage every foundation, law firm, accounting firm, and company attending today's free webinar to consider making a contribution to support our work. It is so important now more than ever. Thank you. And back to you, Tim. Thank you, Donna. Uh, now we're going to just lay out uh, in context what we're going to be talking about today. Um, this is, uh, uh, we're going to focus primarily on phase two and three of what Congress has passed. Phase one, uh, they passed last month, and it was um, a special appropriations uh, to do um, uh, line up more testing uh, and other things. Phase two is where uh, there are provisions that uh, actually um, relate to nonprofits. And so we're gonna go through those. Uh, and then uh, we will dive even deeper into phase three, the new CARES Act that was signed into law last Friday. But I do wanna flag for everybody. Congress is already looking and talking about and exploring a phase four. And um, behind the scenes, they're actually talking about a phase five. So this is not over. Uh, we need to, uh, as a community, still come together so that our voices can be heard at the federal level. And uh, as I will turn to in a moment uh, elsewhere. So uh, again, today we're gonna focus primarily on phases two and three. Uh, Rick? Next slide, what we're gonna cover in detail uh, is what you need to know. We're gonna dive deeper into Families First Act, the CARES Act, and some other federal actions that are underway. Um, we're going to be answering questions um, at a couple different spots in here so that you all uh, can learn more about uh, the Families First Act and the CARES Act. Uh, and uh, then we're going to turn to um, what you all can do uh, and how we all need to be acting together. Uh, and uh, the, the concern is uh, not just on securing financing, but to be advocates at the state, local, and federal levels so that nonprofits are not left out of policy decisions that affect nonprofits and the communities that we are serving. So Rick, I have a final uh, slide and then I'm gonna turn things over. And this is the uh, important slide which concerns um, the disclaimer. Uh, this is fast moving as everybody knows. Uh, and so we are doing our best to assemble all available information. Um, we are diving deep into the legislation itself, reaching out to uh, see if there's any interpretive guides, uh, any other information that's out there, um, and pulling it all together for you. Uh, what we uh, are handicapped by is we do not have uh, any federal rules yet, any regs or guidelines. They just are not there. Uh, and so uh, this is our best understanding of the law now, but the law is not fully written. These are just the statutes and not the rules and the regs and guidelines, or even at the state level where there will also be legislation. So we need to be aware that this is a moving target. Um, and I need to be emphasizing there in red that this is not legal or financial advice for any organization. Everybody who will be presenting on this call um, is a, an attorney. I'm a lawyer. David Thompson, who's our Vice President of Public Policy, is a lawyer. Tiffany Carter, who is our Policy Counsel, is a lawyer. 
and David Heinen, who is the Vice President for Public Policy and Advocacy of the North Carolina Center for Nonprofits, is a lawyer. But we are not your lawyer. Therefore, um, please know that this is an overview and not um, any sort of advice for you. So, Rick, what I want to do now is turn the show over to uh, David Thompson. As I mentioned before, David is our Vice President of Public Policy here at the National Council of Nonprofits. David has been uh, engaged deeply in uh, the lobbying, advocacy work, uh, getting nonprofits put into uh, the Families First Act in, in the first place and then expanding it into uh, the larger um, bill in the CARES Act. Uh, David has been um, deeply involved with the coalition that uh, came together and 40 groups uh, signed the initial letter that, that David wrote and uh, from that um, more than 200 signed a, a similar letter um, that, that was based off the first. And so we're, um, we've been in the thick of it for you. Uh, and uh, David has continued to dive deeper and deeper into this to explain things. So David, let me turn it over to you now. Thank you, Tim. And Rick, next slide, please. I'll just say slide, please. First topic is the Families First Act. Enacted low these 13 days ago, it seems like an ancient statute, but it was only 13 days ago that the Senate passed this significant piece of legislation, probably $100 billion worth of spending on a wide variety of things, including social programs, including unemployment, including lots of other things. We're only going to focus on these two items uh, for our discussion here. One is the paid sick and family leave provisions that were required for anyone dealing with COVID-19. And I would say at the very beginning, no one imagined that we would be as in bad a shape as we are now as when they wrote this legislation. They probably would have written it differently. Some of these things don't much apply anymore. I'll flag those as we go through. But there, these two things go together. It's paid sick and family leave and refundable payroll tax credit. Uh, along with some modifications to that under the CARES Act. We're gonna go through those starting now. Next slide. Paid leave, enacted, signed into law on, I believe, March 18th. Key items is that the, it applies to employers with fewer than 500 employees. Now, 500 employees are counted both full-time and part-time employees as counting heads. And the, stat, the standard is the Fair Labor Standards Act, not the Small Business Act or tax law. It's the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, so it's part-time and full-time to, to get to the 500 count. Uh, workers who are independent contractors are not considered employees under the Fair Labor Stand Federal Fair Labor Standards Act, so they are not part of that 500 count. We received Actually, it was 1,100 questions in advance. So I'm trying to preempt some of them and address some of the questions as we go through. Uh, there's some questions about, in this law, there's exemption or exception. The law doesn't apply to some healthcare workers. That's a question that relates to if the employer declares that the doctor is essential, the nurse or the dietitian at a senior living center is essential, then the leave requirements do not apply. Got a lot of questions about that. There's also the issue of, well, what about, isn't there an exception or exemption for smaller employers, 50 employees or fewer? The answer is at the option of an employer that has 50 or fewer, fewer than 50 employees, if the employer can make the case that providing the leave would jeopardize the viability of the business going forward, then there can be an exception. But that's a very tough standard and one that's going to require going back and forth and a whole lot of regulation. Tim said earlier that the regulations aren't out. The Department of Labor is trying mightily to provide guidance, which you'll see on the screen in a moment, and to provide posters of employee rights that you see on the screen right now. The, this, this will be developed along the way. The general rule of fewer than 500 employees, the 
rules for paid leave, paid sick leave, paid family leave, and the refundable re tax credit apply to you. The law does not go into effect until tomorrow, April Fool's Day. No accidental, not intentional. Um, so any actions, any layoffs, anything done before tomorrow do not trigger this act. And it runs through the end of this year. Next slide, please. There, this is, I'm gonna be going through it as quickly as possible. And it, as the law was written, it caused a lot of us to scratch our heads. There are two types of leave. There's paid sick leave, two weeks of paid sick leave, and there are two types of that. Then there's family leave, paid sick, 10 weeks of paid family sick leave. So that's three different things and there's a lot of overlap. So let me focus first. Employee sick leave. You, the employee can claim starting tomorrow, employee can claim employee paid sick leave if one of these three criteria apply. The employee's been put in a quarantine or isolation order, is uh, it, under the advice of a doctor has been told or a healthcare professional has been told to self-quarantine or experiencing sick symptoms of uh, COVID-19. Employee who cannot come into work and cannot telework and I can't emphasize enough can't work or telework. If an employee can telework in self-quarantine, then the rules don't apply. And that's within your organization to determine who can and can't telework. If you're running a thrift shop, you can't really telework there. If you're writing reports, you can. So that's the organization by organization structure. One of those three criteria, individually quarantined or under an isolation order by federal, state, or local government, or advice of, count of, of doctors or experiencing the symptoms, then you're entitled to paid sick leave. What does that mean? Paid at your regular rate of pay up to $511 a day. You get two weeks, meaning 10 days of paid sick leave. So up to 10 days at $5,110 uh, as the totality of your paid sick leave for being sick. Next slide. Family leave. It still comes under the sick leave category, but it's family leave. And I'll say it now and I'll say it again. This is confusing and doesn't quite make sense to me. But if you are for these, if you are taking care of someone, caring for a quarantined individual, or caring for a child due to school closure, uh, daycare center uh, closure or your child care pro uh, provider is not available. You can be home from work, uh, you, you can't work, and if you can't telework also, you're entitled to two thirds pay for 10 weeks, I'm sorry, for two weeks, the first two weeks. That's um, up to $200 a day, or for the same 10 days, two weeks period, up to $2,000 over the entire paid sick leave period. Next slide. Here's the other kind of leave, and it's 10 weeks that follows the first two weeks of emergency family and medical leave. This is really just emergency family leave. After the first two week period where you're homesick yourself or you're homesick taking care of a child or a spouse, then after the two week period, you're entitled to two, uh, 10 weeks of two thirds pay. If you are either caring for a child, the same criteria before, caring for a child if the child's school or daycare center is closed, um, or the, the same criteria about uh, your child care provider isn't available. The job protections are that you have to be given your job back after the 10 weeks of family leave. There's an exception for employers that are smaller than 25 employees if the employer can make the case that it would be a hardship to put the per employee back into the same job. Again, that's going to require regulations. That's a tough standard for the employer to apply. And it's the same two-thirds pay up to $200 a day 
and over the 10, uh, the 10 weeks. Next slide. Now, I mentioned at the outset that this was done 13 days ago. No one imagined that the whole, that most of the country would be shut down. Uh, many businesses are not working. It's very clear in the guidance that the Department of Labor issued last Friday that if an employer, if you, the nonprofit, shut down all operations, if you close your workplace, that cancels the leave, the paid leave requirement. The good news is your employees would likely be entitled to un, uh, el be eligible for unemployment insurance in your state. And a little later, I'm going to talk about why unemployment's uh, a good option for plenty of employees. But if your whole operation is closed down or certain parts of your operation are closed down, for example, this example, if you have a headquarters in one place and you have to close your thrift shops because of orders of the governor that there are no non-essential businesses operating, then the leave requirements under the Family First Act are uh, erased or, or eliminated for the for the, for the duration of that closure. But again, employees can uh, go for uh, leave. Next slide, please. So employers are saying, wait a minute, we're being required to pay. How do we get that money back? This is uh, in the same law, there is enacted a refundable payroll tax credit. Let me pause here to say that is a huge victory for the charitable nonprofit community. In every other disaster, just about every other disaster our country has faced, natural disasters, when Congress creates a, a leave incentive or when, when Congress creates an employment incentive to encourage employers to do things, to do the right things, they've always tended to create an income tax credit. And as many of you who wrote questions, and as all as you know, we're tax exempt, we, meaning we don't pay income taxes. So an income tax credit is of no use to most charitable nonprofits. Many of us have been advocating regularly, repeatedly, obnoxiously on this point for the last several years, when it comes to disasters, when it comes to a variety of things. We were successful. We were so successful in making it clear to Congress that a payroll tax credit is the right way to go for nonprofits, that they extended it to all employers, for-profit and nonprofit alike. So once again, the nonprofit community innovates. Uh, so the way this works is that an employer paying the mandated leave, whether it's the sick leave of $511 or the family leave of $200 a day, the employer totals that up and then um, deducts what the employer would ordinarily pay in payroll tax in the employer's side of payroll taxes. And if the paid leave costs are greater than the pay, the employer side of payroll taxes than you would have had to pay, then Treasury refunds you the extra. So if you are paying five thousand dollars and your payroll taxes are ten thousand dollars, no, no, if you pay five thousand dollars and your payroll taxes are two thousand dollars, you'll get a check back uh, for three thousand dollars. So. 5,000 paid and paid leave, taxes are only 2,000, you'll get a check from the treasury for the amount. You do that on your, uh, when you file your quarterly returns. Under the paid sick leave mandate, employers paying the employees um, must, must self-isolate and all those things. Um, all of this is refundable to you. The, uh, again, it's the, both the sick leave, 511, and the other leave. Not sure I've said it, said it as clearly as I wanted to, but we'll get to those in questions, I'm sure. Next slide, please. Or, actually. Oh, David, David, this is Tiffany. Let's, the other let's slide. take a pause here. Um, this is Tiffany Gorley Carter with the National Council of Nonprofits. And we do have some questions about the tax credit and these paid leave provisions. So I wanted to go over those real quick. Um, first, the governor of a state has ordered all non-essential businesses to close due to COVID-19. Does that count as state-ordered quarantine for the purposes of paid leave? 
We don't think so. We've checked with trade with uh, labor. We've checked with the Small Business Administration. There's not a clear statement, but we feel confident in saying, thanks for asking, great question. We feel confident in saying that the state order has to be specific to an individual, such as individuals with COVID-19 must self-isolate and so forth. Uh, this is a general shutdown to prevent the spread. Uh, similar language, but we feel confident that that shutdown does not trigger a massive paid leave for obligation for every employer and every Okay, so the next one. Paid leave opportunity for Okay. Um, moving on to healthcare workers. Are all healthcare workers exempt from the paid leave provision? No, another good question. The language of the law, remember 23 or 13 days ago, they were anticipating that lots of employers or lots of healthcare providers were gonna need their staff. So they couldn't be taking, uh, there was an objection to the idea that everyone, all the doctors and nurses would be taking time off because of the child care uh, problems or lack of child care or the kids out of school. So the law allows the employer to say no, uh, to deny the, uh, the family leave provision or family leave opportunity for healthcare people. It's written broadly. So earlier I mentioned the dietitian at a healthcare, I mean at a, a retirement facility or an uh, elder care facility. It goes that far. So if the employer uh, chooses to uh, exclude the healthcare related staff, then they can do so. The daily pay of, of $511. What if that is less than um, the nonprofit pays their employees per day? Can the nonprofit pay the rest um, up to the amount of paid leave? Can they plus up to the regular pay? Yes, they can. And they can take it, they can do that out of their existing paid leave program. They can take, they can do it just out of the, their general funds and the goodness of their heart. The amount they pay extra above the 511 or the 200 per day does not count, cannot be claimed for the refundable tax credit. But um, uh, it certainly would help the employees and the individual employees. Uh, I'm looking at the a box. We've gotten a bunch of questions about the, you were commenting about the fewer than 50 employees. So. Um, did they hear right that nonprofits with fewer than 50 employees are exempt from the paid leave provision? Not entirely. It's the employers can exempt them. And this is a, this is a confusing area and we get a lot of questions in this area. So I'm glad you brought it up. It's five, fewer than 500 and the law applies. For 50 or fewer than 50, the employer has to make the case that it would create an undue hardship for the employer to be giving so many people leave and paying for it. But it would, too, it would be too disruptive to the organization's operations. Right now, it's gonna be hard to argue since most, organ most nonprofits and other businesses have been ordered to shut down in the first place. But presuming health area, 50 and fewer, the employer can decide that it would be too tough for the organization. It would threaten its viability, and the employer has to make the case to the Department of Labor. Thanks, David. We, we have hundreds of more questions, but we're gonna keep going and we'll get back to questions here in a little bit. Terrific. Next slide, please. Tamara, you want to introduce us? Okay, um, we're moving on to the CARES Act. CARES Act was enacted way back on Thursday, no, way back on Friday night. And it's, um, the prior page says what CARES Act stands for. None of us can remember the CARES Act. It is the $2 trillion bill. Actually, let's go back a page. It is the $2 trillion bill. 
It was approved unanimously, despite some shenanigans and things like that. It was signed, and it has significant relief for nonprofits. Next slide. I'm going to hit these six. Er nope. Okay. Um, looking at these items, we're only going to talk about the six big items that are sector-wide issues. There's a lot in this act for subsectors like cultural institutions, ed higher education, regular education, um, hospitals, and many other uh, nonprofit programs and, or programs that nonprofits perform on behalf of governments. Not going to go into those, we're just going to cover the sector wide issues. This next slide, I'm guessing, will tell me. Oh well. Uh, sorry, we're, we're, we're running through the orders. Uh, hopefully, you've all seen this. This is a cheat sheet we created over the weekend. You can get it on the homepage of the National Council of Nonprofits highlighted there. This is the three different uh, recap of the three different loan programs. Next slide. The first one is, uh, here, here are the three. There's the Paycheck Protection Program. Sometimes you hear that called the 7A program on steroids. 7A program is the longstanding Small Business Administration loan program for small business startups that couldn't get capital elsewhere. In the past, it did not apply to charitable nonprofits. That's changed for the time being. There's also the emergency EIDL, which is Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. I'm gonna go through that. And then the Mid-Size Business Loan Program, or the big three, those are the three and the three columns of that chart. Next slide. This, this first one is the probably the most important. Um, and there are going to be a lot of questions, so let me do a preemptive uh, set of observations. Of the, thir of the 1,100 questions I've received so far, I've gotten a lot of concern, a lot of confusion. So let me... In, First, describe the mindset of Congress. We get a lot of questions like, if I laid off staff, am I cut out of the program? Are we disqualified uh, if we cut pay or, or reduce staff? It helps to understand why these loan programs were created. Congress wants you to employ people. If you can keep them on, that's great. If you had to take adverse actions already, they want you to undo the actions and bring them back into work or to mitigate those actions. Did you cut staff? They want you to bring them back. Did you cut pay? They want you to try to get the pay back up to where it was. Do you pay more than $100,000? Well, they're not too keen on subsidizing. They're not too keen on paying or subsidizing salaries over $100,000. So there are limits um, with how far they'll go to help you. But I'm gonna go through all those things. So let me go through the, some general rules here on the Paycheck Protection Loan Program. Again, this is sometimes called 7A. This is sometimes called the SBA Small Business Loan Program. Paycheck Protection Program, PPP is how most people are abbreviating it. This is the really good one that you've heard about. Who is eligible? 500 employers with 500 and fewer employees. Once again, that counts both full-time employees and part-time employees. It does not include independent contractors. Same rule as before. Uh, and, but importantly, independent contractors can apply to these loans on their own. So they, they too can apply for these loans, so they're not left out in the cold. This applies to what kind of employers? 501c3 organizations are eligible. That includes religious institutions are eligible because the statute, the Internal Revenue Code in Section 501c3 expressly makes clear that religious institutions are automatically, automatically qualify for 501c3 status. They don't have to fill out the paperwork, they don't have to do the Form 990, but they are 501c3. The language of the statute of the CARES Act makes clear that it applies to 501c3 organizations. And that's um, hopefully everybody on this call. 
does not apply. This is the Paycheck Protection Program. Does not apply to social welfare 501c4 organizations. Doesn't apply to chambers of commerce. Um, it's primarily, and 501c3s are the largest share, I believe 1.2 or 1.3 million uh, nonprofits in the country. Um, and yes, you can get loans if you are eligible to get Medicaid. Probably get a question about this later as well. The earlier versions of the CARE Act, and it took some mighty advocacy by a lot of people to get this taken out. The earlier version said that if you're eligible for Medicaid, that's Title 19, you cannot, you, you could not be qualified for this loan program. That language was taken out. Thank your lobbyists, thank your friends who do advocacy. And if you don't do advocacy, please join them in the future. Uh, instead, the limitation is on affiliates of nonprofits. The rules are will be more cl more clearly delineated by the Small Business Administration, but they have existing regulations that say if and they, they specifically apply to nonprofits that are that are qualifying for these loans. If you are an affiliated nonprofit and the parent exercises control or has the opportunity or the power to exercise control over things other than branding, other than contractual things like you have to use the right logo, you have to um, do the marketing types of things. Uh, if the parent can exercise control over the affiliates, then um, all of the employees are counted in one big total. Kind of makes sense if you are a big national organization controlling everything all over the country, you're not really a small business. There are some nonprofits, perhaps many on this, this webinar could, could get tripped up. So we will be watching out for clear, greater clarification. We're concerned about that provision and we'll, we'll be watching to see what we can do to, to fix it. You see the asterisk there by 500 or fewer employees. That could change with the, the advocacy for phase four legislation or phase five legislation, we all want that number to be higher because we want all nonprofits to be able to participate here. Loan amount. Loan amount, how much can you borrow? Two and a half times a month, your monthly payroll. The, the ways of counting that, that I won't go into, but just assume you take your, uh, you look back for a year, you divide by 12 uh, for payroll and that's the, your maximum loan. You can use, there are other ways of counting if you didn't exist, if you weren't in existence for 12 months, you started January 1st, for instance, there are other ways of counting it to come up with the calculation. Loan use, you can use for payroll, that includes payroll costs of processing and so forth. You can use for benefits like vacation and healthcare and uh, um, retirement or uh, sick leave and the variety of things like that. You can use the money to pay your rent and mortgage. The whole point is Congress recognized that you're going to be shutting down or you're not able to make payroll and make your pay your expenses because you've had to shut down. So rents included, rent or mortgage payments and debt service if you have bonds, if you have things like that. How do you apply? You apply by going to your local bank. The and today, there are about 1,800 uh, 1800 banks where you can apply to, to get a loan. The, um, F, the uh, Small Business Administration is struggling to find more. And Secretary Mnuchin announced that the, uh, they're trying to set it up so that every FDIC insured bank in the country or similarly insured credit union would be able to issue these loans. There's a big pot of money, $349 billion is available for these loans. They might run out, um, but, uh, but we hope not. And if they do run out, we hope Congress will appropriate more money because this is vitally important. The, and then you can apply through June 30th, but if, this, if we don't lick this virus and don't have it uh, the country back to work, Congress may extend it uh, again. Next, um, next slide, please. And as I'm doing this, I'm going to ask my colleague, Tiffany, she doesn't know I'm doing this. Would you check the SBA site to see if there's any breaking news? Are they announcing anything? 
Secretary Mnuchin declared that they're, they're going to get this going soon, they're going to be expanding, and they're going to be posting greater guidance for everyone uh, sooner than later. And there has been no update on the SBA website. Okay, thank you. This is live, live uh, as it happens. While we're um, uh, going back to that prior page, sorry, I moved this too fast. What documents are you going to need uh, when you apply to the loan? That is the $10, $10 million question or the two and a half times monthly payroll question. We presume, and we're going out on a limb here because we don't have guidance. That's what I'm, I was hoping Tiffany would identify for us as I was talking. We presume, we don't have it in writing, that you will need payroll records, uh, records of your mortgage and rent, and of outstanding debt. This is things that you can start accumulating. Hopefully, you don't have to go into the office to find these things. You have them posted online somewhere. And so it's just getting your paperwork and ducks in a row uh, in advance is a good thing. Next slide, please. Loan forgiveness. Is it real? Yes, it is. I'd say a quarter of the questions was, was really? We can do this and get the loan forgiven so it's free money? And the answer is yes, with a, of course, with a variety of strings. The calculation is complicated. Um, I can't work through all the nuances, but basically your average monthly pay during the covered period, a covered period is the eight weeks after you get the money. Loan origination is the official term. Uh, compared to a test period. The test period is a two or three month period last year. So February 15th, 2019 through June 30th, 2019. Uh, so pre-loan, what, what was your payroll like back then? And they're gonna compare it. Forgiveness, if you have the same number of people working and they're paying the same salaries, then you can get 100% hundred percent forgiven forgiveness of your loan. Now there's caveats. If you reduce salaries by more than 25%, you get that gets deducted. If you have fewer full-time equivalents than you did in the prior period or prior uh, test period, you get, uh, you, you lose out on some of the, and it's, it's a math. Problem. And if you pay staff more than a hundred, uh, we have some background noise. If we, if you pay staff more than the monthly equivalent of hundred thousand dollars, so divide hundred thousand dollars by twelve, I think that's eighty five hundred ish. Then, uh, if you pay more than that, you cannot claim that money as paid toward uh, during the, the eight week period to count to count toward loan forgiveness. So, if you're paying someone twenty thousand dollars in a month only the first 8,500 would be applied toward the, uh, the forgiveness of the loan. The rest, um, you, would, you would have to pay the, continue to pay the loan on that. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This, uh, I expect we'll ask more questions, we'll come back to that. Big item, loans available on Friday. I mentioned Secretary Mnuchin said that they're rushing to get this through the Small Business Administration. He announced on Fox Business yesterday that the loans will be available Friday. Hope it's true. Uh, we keep hoping that we're gonna get, see some more materials and more feedback from the Small Business Administration and my colleague Tiffany will keep checking just to make sure. Uh, on loan forgiveness, if you rehire people, uh, I did not catch that. Uh, uh, if you rehire, if you have to lay off people, I'm going to do a verbal correction of this slide. If you are forced to lay people off, furlough, reduce staff between April, uh, February 15th of this year and April 26th, you will not be penalized in the loan forgiveness if you have rehired those folks by June 30th. That should say by June 30th on this slide. Thought I'd fixed it. Um, the, th this is important because many people are saying, hey, but we've already laid off. Can we still get the loan? Yes, you can. Uh, if we've laid people off and we're struggling 
can we get the forgiveness? The answer is yes, you can if you get them back on the payroll by June 30th. Another, but what if we don't have work for them? If you're paying them to be idle, you can get the loan forgiveness. That was the whole point of Congress, of getting money into the hands of people so they're not starving. Okay, next slide. I went longer on that topic because it uh, is of vital importance and I'm hoping everyone's gonna be applying first thing Friday morning. I'm gonna pick up the pace now and talk about the second ex loan program. There are two types of this. I'll try not to confuse you. The one is the normal EIDL, Emergency Economic Injury Disaster Loans. This has been around, this is typically when there's a hurricane and you're wiped out. You have um, there's the, the, the damage to your property and then there's the EI, the economic injury. The, um, and then there's a second type, which is a special thing that came in the last version of the CARES Act. It's uh, quick quick money, so we'll come back to that. Let's do a next slide. The, the normal private nonprofits can qualify for this. This loan is up to $2 million. Private nonprofits is not what you think. Small Business Administration is not normally uh, nonprofit friendly, and the language of, the, of their statute proves it. They talk about private nonprofits and public nonprofits, and none of us know the difference in what they're talking about. The gist, the bottom line is that private nonprofits means most charitable nonprofits, not religious institutions. So not the church, not the preacher, but it does apply to the church daycare center or the church food bank. The short answer to all of this is if you're interested in applying for an EIDL, EIDL loan, go ahead and apply and let Small Business Administration decide whether you're in or out of the club. They have said very clearly, they are going out of their way to expand who can get this money because the world, the country is hurting. So they will um, cut you slack to go ahead and apply. You apply directly online to, uh, to the SBA. That, line, that link will be available to you uh, in the closeout. And these are uh, available through December 31st. Next slide, please. This is for uh, the provisions, is uh, the good news on this loan. There is based purely on credit score, not a lot of the other uh, hoops that you used to have to go through. And for this one, waives personal guarantee up to $200,000. I know that's a great relief for nonprofit leaders who don't really wanna be personally liable for the organization. Is there forgiveness? No, next slide. Emergency advance, it's called an emergency advance, it's called an EIDL uh, grant, uh, lots of different terms for it. This is again, private nonprofits are eligible. Go ahead and try and let the uh, uh, SBA decide who's who, or who can get it and who can't. If you apply, you can get $10,000 within three days. It's intended as a rapid fire, get money in there as quickly as possible and you can apply through December 31st. Next slide. The, um, there's the link. You don't have to write it down, it'll be available. Perhaps someone can put it in the chat box now that the traffic in the chat box has waned a bit. This is where you go to apply and there'll be extra updated materials on there. Next slide, please. David, this is Tiffany. Um, just a quick clarification. We got a few questions in the chat box and elsewhere. Can you apply for both the PPP and the EIDL at the same time, or are they either or? Fantastic question. You can, well, you can apply for both, and, you, and can you take both? EIDL, normal, the big one, uh, you can't get it and um, a short answer is you can't get two loans for the same expenses. So if you're pay, doing payroll and mortgage and, uh, and uh, debt service and things like that, you can do one or the other, but you can't do both for the same money. But, or and, for the EIDL advance or grant, you can apply for that if 
you get it, but then ultimately are denied for the EIDL loan, that $10,000 is forgiven. If you apply for that and then you apply for the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Loans, then the $10,000 is folded into your loan amount. So that's the one exception uh, that goes there. Thank you for raising it. Thank you for inter interjecting. The third item is the third, it's the right-hand column on that chart you see in the lower right-hand corner. That's not quite a consolation prize, but it certainly was added late in the game and the advocacy effort here. This is for nonprofits cut out of the other two loan programs. This is for nonprofits and others that employ between 500 and 10,000 employees. It's, we are, those in, the, in this category are eligible to borrow money to use to retain 90% of your staff. It's unclear exactly how much of that. This is the, it, this money comes out of the humongous $454 billion loan pool that the airlines are getting money, money out of, national security is getting money out of, a variety of things like that. This is for other employers, it's $454 billion worth. This is a program, it's not fully worked out. The Department of Treasury is doing other things and they will get to it. We're not sure how we're gonna, how you apply for it, probably through local banks. Um, ultimately, to get, we, the things we know is that to get this money, you have to, you the borrower, have to make a good faith certification that you, the need is based on economic condition. That one's easy. Funds are gonna be used to retain and restore your employment. If you've laid off, you'll bring them back up to 90%. If you have them still, you'll keep them, you'll keep paying your staff. Uh, and also, and you won't send staff overseas or send your operations overseas. That's more for the for-profit side. And you won't abrogate or cancel existing collective bargaining agreements and you'll stay neutral in organizing campaigns. Uh, it's available through December 31st. Next slide, please. It's, I, I think I used the word amorphous. If I didn't, I meant to. The way it's written, this is the text of the statute. The secretary shall endeavor to seek the implementation of a program. We and colleagues have talked with folks at Treasury. They are working on it. They are trying to figure out how they're going to do this, but they're doing all the other things first. Advocacy is needed here. We need advocacy. We need you who are affected by this to start talking to you. If you have DC folks, talk, folks talking to them, please do. Talk to your DC folks, talk to your state association of nonprofit, tell them what you need so that we can make sure that the program is built out of the regulatory stage that suits your needs, or if we need legislative fixes, we can do it. None of this is carved in stone. Those asterisks I had earlier apply to all of this. Next slide, please. Now shifting to giving. A lot of people, I'm gonna pick up the pace again. The, give, the CARES Act included for the first time this above the line deduction. This is something that a lot of people have been working on. It's not as good as we want it, and we're going to keep working on it, but Congress enacted an above-the-line deduction. That can sometimes called universal, sometimes called non-itemizer deduction. If you take the standard deduction in 2020, as an individual, you can donate $300 and take it off your taxes. If you're, that's for an individual, for a couple, you can take $600. It's... Um, it's only for 2020. There is a lot of chatter on this subject. Some people are suggesting maybe there's a drafting error and it extends beyond 2020. Nobody, but the people who wrote it think they wrote it for only 2020. We will be working to expand it, to uh, make it retroactive. We will be working, when I say we, I'm hoping I mean everyone on this uh, program as well as everyone, uh, every nonprofit. Increase the level. Make it retroactive to 2019, extend it for 2022 or longer. Those are our, our advocacy wish lists. Right now, it's a $300 do donation. People can give now and take it off on their taxes. Uh, certainly, you can help some. It's not huge, but it's certainly a start. The law also lifts the uh, adjusted gross income cap for those who itemize. Currently, it's 60%, because you can only give 60% of your taxable income. This lifts it up to 100% so that you can give it all this year to charitable nonprofits. It also raises the corporate limits for cash donations. Corporations 
currently or typically can only give 10% of taxable income. This raises it to 25% so that we can all uh, get those funds in back into the community. And it raises the food donation cap from 15% to 20%. Next slide, please. Employee retention tax credits. Let me say, if you don't qualify for or don't take the Paycheck Protection Program loans, you can do this. This is a refundable payroll tax credit of up to $5,000 per employee per quarter. That's you keep them on the payroll, you keep paying them, you can get a $5,000 credit per person that's applied to your payroll taxes. Remember I talked earlier that uh, we, we do that for the paid leave provisions under the Families First Act. Same, uh, same credit applied here. It has to be to qualify, it has to, you have to have been an uh, ongoing concern uh, in the beginning of 2020, experienced a whole or partial shutdown, uh, saw a drop in revenues of at least 50% of the first quarter compared to the first quarter of 2019. Next slide. Tax exempt organizations are included. Um, and there's odd language in there that the entity's whole operations must be taken into account. And again, that point, you can't take the Paycheck Protection Credit and uh, program loans and take advantage of this. Mm, uh, of this one. Next item, please. Oh, good. We're going to give all of you a break and bring in a true expert uh, from out in the real world. David Heinen, are you available? <laughs> Hey, David, this is David Heinen from the North Carolina Center for Nonprofits in Raleigh, North Carolina. We're, we're going to talk briefly about some of the unemployment insurance provisions in the CARE Act. And briefly for nonprofits, they, 501c3 nonprofits generally fall into one of three categories for unemployment. And either, like other businesses, we pay state unemployment tax based on our experience rating, based on the employment history of the organization and uh, workplace stability and things like that pay a tax regularly uh, to into the state unemployment uh, trust fund or secondly nonprofits have the option of not paying that tax but instead reimbursing their state unemployment trust fund for claims that's called self-insuring and we'll get to that in a moment and then the third um, for nonprofits that are either houses of worship religious organizations or nonprofits with, four, with fewer than four employees who work during any 20 weeks of a year, they're exempt from unemployment. And that means that they don't pay any un unemployment tax, have no liability for it, but also that when their employ em employees are out of work, that they generally are not eligible for state unemployment benefits. So what the CARES Act does is first for individuals, and I mentioned that last category of exempt nonprofits, because there, I know that we heard and the National Council of Nonprofits heard from many, many religious organizations and very small organizations that were either thinking about laying off staff or furloughing staff or had already done so and were concerned that their staff then were, no, were not eligible for any unemployment benefits. So one of the things that the CARES Act does is create a new pandemic unemployment assistance or PUA program that provides coverage for, uh, for unemployment coverage through state unemployment programs for those individuals. And that includes self-employed people, gig workers, uh, uh, independent contractors who wouldn't be covered under unemployment. And there's some other circumstances where people have used up too much unemployment over the past year to be eligible for benefits under some state laws. All those people, including those exempt nonprofit employees, are eligible for, for some unemployment benefits under the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program uh, that will be administered through state unemployment programs. In addition, uh, two other benefits, kind of working backwards to what you're seeing on your screen, that the federal government is paying states uh, to provide to beef up unemployment benefits for by six hundred dollars per week, which is really significant. So in North Carolina, for example, the maximum uh, weekly benefit is three hundred fifty dollars. So that that would mean that the maximum weekly benefit is almost tripling. Um, in North Carolina right now with this federal payment. And that's all paid for by the federal uh, 
government for, for four months. And it's also extending, um, allowing states and, and states may need to take either executive action or legislative action to make this happen, but waiving that one week waiting period. So essentially the federal government is paying that for, uh, typically employees when they're when they're out of work need to wait a week to be eligible for unemployment benefits. This is allowing immediate um, availability for it and having the federal government paying for it and also extending uh, by 13 weeks the eligibility of unemployment, which again in a state like North Carolina more than doubles that that period of eligibility for individuals for unemployment. But on the employer side, um, most employers, so the, the first category of nonprofits, those who pay, pay state unemployment tax and all for-profit businesses um, are based on experience rating. And what would ha typically happen is if they're laying off or furloughing a lot of employees, their experience rating would go way up and their tax rate would go w way up. And what the, the um, CARES Act and, uh, and almost all or maybe all states have um, taken action to, to make this happen. Uh, ensures that, that these type of employers are held harmless because their tax, their experience rate, the rate, the state unemployment tax rate that they play, pay will be frozen essentially, um, regardless of whether they have to lay off staff or furlough staff. And then the other big change is for that second category of nonprofits I mentioned, the self-insured organizations. And those are the ones, again, who don't pay the state unemployment tax, but instead, if they lay off staff, they would usually reimburse their state unemployment trust fund for the full amount of that. And this is typically organizations with 10 or more employees um, decide to make that option if they've got a relatively stable workforce because it's cheaper to, to just pay the cost of, of uh, unemployment insurance for their workers when they're out of work rather than to pay the tax. Obviously, that, 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 make, that calculation makes a lot of sense under normal circumstances, but we're in anything but normal circumstances for the employment market right now. And because of that, um, those self-insured employers without some type of relief are going to be on the hook for a significant cost. And those are healthcare organizations, including healthcare systems, uh, food banks, senior service providers, child care providers, affordable housing providers, you know, a lot of really YMCAs, a lot of major nonprofits fall in that category. What the CARES Act does is provide this, um, federal funding to cover half of what those employers would reimburse. And the way it works is the federal government, as long as the states um, have a system that makes it work, so it may require a tweak to state unemployment laws, will pay the state for half of that amount. Um, so unless states individually decide to cover the other half, those, those nonprofits are still on the hook for half of those claims, which could still be very significant. So that is still kind of an ongoing uh, concern for nonprofits. It's better than what it would have been but for this provision in the CARES Act, but it, but it is uh, still a, a very big concern. Thank you, David. I'll and turn it back over to David. I want to assure everyone that Yes, this is complicated, and that self-same uh, David Heinen uh, that you just heard from wrote a very powerful blog on our website that uh, explains this in more detail and makes it very user-friendly. We're seeing a lot of comments on the side that, gee, would some people uh, make more money or earn more or get more money uh, staying on unemployment for four months? And that was actually one of the last snags in the Senate bill getting it passed is that it almost got blocked uh, because of that question. But that raises the separate question of should you take a loan? Should you uh, enable your employees to uh, take unemployment by furloughing them? Those are all ethical and human re resources and legal questions that I'm going to encourage you to ask your board and ask your folks. Now I want to turn it over, next slide, to my colleague, Tiffany Gorley carter Thank you, David. Uh, I do have some good news for borrowers going into this. Um, under the CARES Act, all borrowers may go into forbearance through September 30th. This is an update from a uh, notice that the Department of Education put out. And so this is extended through September 30th now. Um, this only applies to federal loans. So if you have private loans, you have a loan through your bank, those types of loans don't apply. So this is only federal loans. But uh, what this means is that 
You can go into forbearance. You don't need to make payments during that time. And we have great news. We just got confirmation that this applies to um, those of you who are working towards public service loan forgiveness. So the time that you're in forbearance counts towards the payment. So it goes from 120 payments down to 114 payments during the next six months. Also, they um, drop the interest rate to 0%. This is automatic, which is really great news. So you're not accruing interest, even if you're in forbearance, which is not normal. And so that also goes through September 30th. Uh, the Secretary of Education also announced that they are stopping all debt collections and wage garnishment. This uh, goes back to the 13th of this month and it goes forward at least 60 days. That is all the more that they've announced, but it wouldn't be surprising to extend that just like they extended the forbearance and 0% interest rate um, going forward. So keep an eye out for those kinds of announcements. And that's also automatic. So this is great for all of the nonprofit organizations who have employees um, who are relying on public service loan forgiveness over 120 payments, that is down to 114 now. Um, with that, I turn it back over to David. Next slide. Thank you, Tiffany. And that uh, loan forgiveness is a big deal for nonprofits. It's not just the individuals with loans. It's a great recruiting tool for nonprofits, but you probably already know that. Okay, we've talked about the two statutes. I'm gonna briefly mention two uh, federal actions, and then we'll go back, we'll move on. Um, Internal Revenue Service, as you know, delayed income tax filings until July 15th. Question we get, did they, how about Form 990s? Did they delay us? The answer is no. Going to take some advocacy. I, there may be a legitimate reason, but I don't know it. Uh, but to that question, we are still on the hook for our filings and uh, need to try to get a straight answer or a reversed answer from the IRS. On a more positive note, the Office of Management and Budget, which is the entity that dictates the rules or manages the rules for federal grants to states and federal grants to nonprofits, has issued two directives. The second one is this uh, memo M2017 that says, agencies, we encourage you to do flexibility. We encourage you to keep paying uh, nonprofits on their grants. I know some governors like the governor of Connecticut has made that same order. If you have, if you're operating under a government grant and it says you have to provide certain performance metrics before you get paid, most likely those are getting waived right now. So go to your federal agency, don't hesitate, go to your federal agency to see if they are granting you flexibility. Because if so, you can keep your people working, you can keep your people on staff. So that's some extra flexibility. Next slide, please. Before we get to questions. Before we get to questions and we're keeping an eye on them, we do want to give a quick uh, shout out for the census that is beginning. The official census day is tomorrow, April 1st, 2020. We encourage everyone to fill out your census immediately and um, you can do it online by phone or you can request a paper questionnaire. You can do it at my2020census.gov. I know that uh, everyone is focused on coronavirus right now, but there is a push to keep an eye out for the census. By filling it out, you're helping not just the Census Bureau reduce uh, burdens on that, but also nonprofits who have been working for literally years getting out the count. There is a note that the Census Bureau has suspended operations, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't still fill out the census. It just means that they have reduced some in-person assistance and in-person follow-up. And so they've also extended the deadline to August 14th. But all of that is just um, part of the whole census process. And so please go online, please fill it out and, um, and keep that top of mind going into the next month. And with that, I think next slide, we're going into questions. Um, we do have a list here, but I did see a couple that were um, asking for some clarification on PSLF, so I will jump into those real quick. Uh, do you need to apply for forbearance? Our understanding is that you do need to contact your loan servicer. It is not automatic as of right now. Um, the other question I saw was about uh, the 114 payments while you're, if you aren't in forbearance. My understanding is you have, that just applies while you're in forbearance. So please fill that, please go into, um, contacting your 
uh, your service provider for forbearance. Um, the 0% interest automatically has already been applied. Um, as for getting copies of these slides uh, and the recording, both will be available afterwards. Uh, it might be tomorrow till we get that out, but we'll be working on it as quickly as possible. And um, I think those were the big ones that I saw for myself. So David, I'm gonna turn questions back over to you. And here's some that we got beforehand and also a few that we got while, uh, while the presentation has been going on. So first up, there's confusion about whether religious organizations can get an SBIA loan. Can you go through when churches do and don't qualify? I'm sorry, did you say the PPP? Religious or? organizations on SBA loans. SBA loans. The it, it depends on which one. Remember, there are two different main types of SBA loans. There's the Paycheck Protection Act. Yes, you can. Don't need a, don't need a letter from the IRS saying, you know, 1024 or, uh, or any of those things. Yes, you can. On the EIDL, the, forget what it stands for, the disaster one. Does, uh, it depends if you are a preacher or a rabbi or a, a, a others, uh, actual, your job is preaching, probably not. If you have other ancillary entities, as I mentioned earlier, daycare, food bank, um, dance studio, I don't know, uh, most likely you can get the loans for those. But most importantly, you don't have to have a letter from the IRS certifying that you're a 501c3. A couple of questions that I'll just go ahead and answer. People were asking for the chart that we mentioned that you can see on the screen on the right side there. That is available on our website. Uh, you can click on the coronavirus webpage within our website and there's all sorts of links and resources that we are regularly updating. So please go there and that includes the chart. Hey there's Tiffany, let me interrupt. Yes. Therese Ritter has announced the first version of the PPP loan application is out. Woohoo! Thank you, Sharice. Um, we will grab that and share it as well. Uh, go to SBA, and I'm sure it'll be right there. Wonderful. Thank you. Breaking news. You heard it here first. Thank you, Becca and Sharice, for doing that. Um, also up on our website is David Heinen's blog. You can find that under the blogs um, link. And then, uh, yes, I think that takes care of a couple of these logistical questions. So. Uh, back to substance, David, uh, do you need a tax exempt determination letter to qualify for the different loans? No. Uh, they may, a bank may ask for it, and if you have it, great, but if you're a religious institution and, and don't have it, tell them to go pound sand, you're entitled, if it's a PPP. There has been rumors about if your organization receives Medicaid payments you are then disqualified. Is that still true? No, that is not still true. Uh, that was in the aver original version. It was a pretty uh, obnoxious provision in the first draft of the Paycheck Protection uh, Program. That was taken out. That was some very effective advocacy. Uh, so if, if you are eligible or if you receive Medicaid and are fewer, 500 or fewer employees, you're eligible. Go for it. There are a lot of questions about above the line deduction or universal deduction. Uh, can you, what is the difference between above the line deduction or the universal deduction? Uh, semantics. Above the line is what tax law people like to call it. Universal is a, it applies to everybody. So it's more of a uh, advocacy term. It's also non itemizer, which is a technical term, you either itemize or you don't itemize. They're all the same, referring to the same thing. The $300 amount, is that total or is that per donation? Total. Good question. Total for an individual and 600 for a couple. And is this permanent or temporary underneath the CARES Act? Is it, I'm sorry, is it, it is temporary. It is, it is for one year. Put an asterisk by that. There is an argument that it could be extended, but don't count on it. Uh, it's available right now. We would like to get it retroactive. We would like to extend it in phase four legislation, but for now it's treated as a one year for 2020 donation. 
credit or deduction. If I've said credit, I apologize. It is a deduction, not a credit. There are a bunch of questions about what qualifies as an employee. So I'm just going to run hmm. through different types of employees and uh, maybe you can do a yes, no, if they qualify full time. Yes, and full time is defined as 40 hours a week. Part time. Uh, for everything we've talked about, part time counts for counting people. It counts toward um, uh, being people on staff for for the loan, uh, and the way you and ultimately you do full time equivalent to do to calculate the to do the math in terms of salaries and things like that. But part time does count. Um, and it could be five hours a week. It could be uh, 30 hours a week. Full time. I lost you. Uh, for the counting of people, does a full time equivalent person count as one employee? Or yes. What about temporary or seasonal employees? Uh, they count in your head count but, or and, you do an annual average monthly workforce. So if you, so it ends up uh, smoothing out. If you run a camp, if you're an organization that has a summer camp where you have uh, 500 employees working part-time, you total up all your people and all, I guess you total up all their hours and you divide by 12 and that gives you a monthly number, monthly head count. I may have garbled that, but it is averaged over the course of a year, so that if you have peaks and valleys, that smooths out to give you a more reasonable number. What about independent contractors? They can apply themselves, but they are not counted as employees for the paid leave or for the, paycheck, the paycheck protection program. And for the Paychecks Protection Program, um, when do they have, when does an employee have to rehire the employees? When does an employer have to rehire the employees to qualify for the PPP loan forgiveness? Um, if you need to, you can lay off now. You have to, um, by June 30th is the short answer. There's a window of when layoffs can happen that you can correct by June 30th. That window is April, is February 15th through April 26th. If you lay off during that time period, you need to bring them back or bring or refill those fill those jobs by June 30th. As for the SBA loans, what if they run out of money in that pool? They shouldn't because that number 350 billion, 349 billion was based on six weeks, all of the salaries of all the 500 and fewer employers in the country for six weeks is 500, about $550 billion. So six weeks, eight weeks, they think they came up with that number on purpose. If they run out, well, we're talking phase four, we're talking phase five legislation. Um, and so it will require advocating for Congress to reopen the, uh, to add more money into the, into the loan program. And I think it would be pretty, I think they would. Can't guarantee it, but that sounds reasonable to, to expect. Let's do a couple more because I know Tim Delaney has some um, closing points that people need to know. Yes, and we've had over 2,000 questions, so we are trying to get to as many as possible, and we'll try to cover as many as possible um, in the days to come, but just so everyone knows that we are trying to, trying to get through these. Uh, is an organization disqualified from the Paycheck Protection Program if all or some of the employees earn $100,000? No. Um, you can only borrow up to the salary. And remember, it's not you're borrowing $100,000, you're borrowing uh, the, the monthly, uh, your two and a half times your monthly expense. So if they make $200,000, which I think is $17,000 $17, a month, you can only borrow 
8,500, which is one twelfth of a hundred thousand times two and a half. Always a problem trying to do math without a chalkboard. Um, you can borrow up to the hundred, but you can't borrow. You can't borrow and you can't pay out and forgive over a hundred. Okay, and last question. I know this is really important for organizations since tomorrow is the first, and so they're looking at whether to lay off or furlough or, um, employees. If some of the staff have already been furloughed, does that disqualify the organization from the loan forgiveness? And actually, muted. Absolutely not. The if someone's already if someone's already been furloughed, it disqualifies them for and, until they're brought back um, from the paid leave provision. That's the April first deadline. If you've laid off staff um, and bring them back, then you get the, you can get the loan forgiveness. Doesn't disqualify you from the loan, the Paycheck Protection Program loan. It doesn't and does not disqualify you from forgiveness. If you don't bring back as many people, it'll reduce how much forgiveness you have. Meaning, you'll have some some money to owe at a four percent loan, but it's still a low loan. Great, thanks, David. Um, I think at this time we're to turn it over to Tim. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, and uh, David, thank you for your expertise and sharing it so broadly. David Heinen, uh, superstar as always, and um, Tiffany uh, actually has a, a superwoman cape um, because uh, she is so good. So thank you all. Um, we are now encouraging you all to take action. Before I turn to that, I want to just emphasize the $300 um, charitable contribution uh, that's, as David said, that's per individual and per, uh, or 600 for um, married couples. Um, it, it, the important thing about that is everyone can take it, everyone in America. It's not just those who itemize, but that is a, uh, it, it's an incentive to give. Um, and so that's $300 extra that people can give and get credit for. Um, the uh, challenge is making sure that people understand that's not a ceiling, uh, that's not the maximum, because you can give a whole lot more than that. And as David mentioned, if um, you're someone who does itemize, uh, you can uh, have the, the normal limits taken off there as well. So we're trying to encourage everybody to give. Um, the you also heard from David, there were uh, lots of advocacy successes in this uh, bill, uh, in both of them as they were moving so quickly through Congress. Um, there were things that we tried to get that were not available um, and the coalition worked very hard, uh, but uh, could not get it over um, the goal line. So we continue to uh, fight for those. I wanna emphasize, we are 501c3 organizations ourselves, um, and we can lobby. Nonprofits can lobby. Uh, nonprofits can advocate. It is legal. Um, and all four of the lawyers here and those who are informed across the country will tell you so. Um, if they are telling you no, then tell them to check out our website. Congress has said that nonprofits can lobby. The IRS has said nonprofits can lobby. There are certain limits. You will not hit them. Uh, you can lobby um, and go to our website and use your voices, take action, join with us and everyone to make sure nonprofits are um, not left out. Next slide. Um, the, here's a, a couple of things that you can take action on. And one of them is first, before you, you apply for these um, uh, loans, ask, uh, do you really need them? Um, and uh, the, the reason that you will have to ask that is that you will have to certify under the Payment Protection Program, for example, uh, uh, that you have to make a good faith certification that uh, there is a need for the loan. Uh, that's based on economic conditions. So you can't just look at it and say, ooh, cool, free money, I don't need it, but I'll go in and apply for it. 
you'll be clogging up the system for everybody else. So uh, please don't. Um, in terms of the emergency uh, EIDL, um, again, uh, you can apply for that 10,000. You're supposed to get it within three days. And if you then want to uh, also apply for the PPP, you can. The $10,000 that you will get for the EIDL can roll into your, uh, let's say, it's 50,000 that you're going for for the PPP. Uh, the 10,000 will roll into that. Um, and if uh, you are complying with all those, uh, that will be forgiven as part of all that. Um, and uh, then on the, the payroll protection program loans, it's uh, two and a half times the monthly payroll is the amount that you can get. Again, it says up to $10 million. Um, that's going to be uh, a I think interesting for a nonprofit of 500 employees or less to have $10 million, but um, who knows? Um, and uh, you should be able to apply at the bank, according to Secretary Mnuchin's interview, um, starting Friday. Um, now, I would ask everybody to um, recognize that we don't have all the answers, you don't have all the answers, and certainly uh, our friends in government, uh, federal, state, local, do not have all the answers. Uh, people are making a lot of this stuff up as they go, so please uh, be patient and kind and uh, expressing our thanks to people along the way, uh, but also take action, be persistent, uh, and speak up for yourselves. Um, another action thing you can do is go to our homepage. After this webinar, we will be um, updating it and we will be getting all the materials. If you just go to our homepage, uh, and uh, we added that, and I'll, I'll point that out in a second where, where you can find that easily, uh, but just go to our homepage, go there, click um, where it says the, the uh, COVID-19, uh, and we have a special landing page for that where we will be posting these so that you can see them quickly. Uh, we will be adding um, the materials uh, there that, are, uh, that, that you've heard today. We'll put David Heinen's uh, unemployment blog there so you don't have to be looking for it elsewhere on our website. Um, we will also be putting the new uh, uh, Paycheck Protection Program loan uh, forms uh, on there that um, came out during the course of this call. Michael Wayland also uh, from South Dakota reports that um, that the Treasury has put out a sheet about those and so we will also post that and anything else. Uh, uh, we encourage you to come back to our website um, which because of all the traffic um, even though we have doubled it in size three times the last few days, it still continues <laughs> to grow. Um, next page, uh, terms of taking action in the states. Uh, if you um, are connecting the dots from what was said before, uh, all this federal activity uh, then flows down to the states. The state laws may have to change. That means that state legislatures will be have to change statutes and executive branch officials or state agencies may have to be changing their rules and regulations. They may be doing that just to conform their own state laws to the new federal uh, requirements. And or they may be doing it independently for their own laws to make sure that they are helping the citizens in your state. Um, David Heinen was talking about some states are doing things on unemployment law issues, others are not. We can lobby, we can do that. Uh, and by we, I mean us collectively, the 10,000 on this call and more. Um, a big issue is gonna be with the government contracts where governments um, enter into grants and contracts, written agreements with nonprofits to perform certain public services. If you look at all the revenue streams for the in entire 501c3 community, we earn collectively 32% of all of our revenue from government contracts and grants. Now they need to be making sure that they're loosening the, uh, the reins so that we can be doing the work. David Thompson mentioned that earlier, but that's gonna require you to be engaged to take action at the state and local level. 
Um, and uh, again, it's also local, your cities and counties may be doing a uh, force to do th some other things as well. So engage. Um, and um, then final slide, you'll see at the top there, our uh, homepage, uh, the, the landing page, go there and uh, we will be, uh, we've already been trying to make sure that it's easy to get access to things from there, um, but we will continue to uh, try to put up uh, the best road signs so that you can get to where you need to be. Um, we've also listed here the items that uh, we think are, are hot that you will want to have access to. We will be making these uh, links as well as uh, some of the other materials mentioned earlier uh, easily available. Um, the, these resources are available to you for free. And again, we will be posting updates uh, as has happened on this call, um, things are evolving um, immediately. And so we are constantly updating all the materials so you have the latest and greatest. So please come back to the website and find things. Uh, then uh, three reminders. Number one, uh, Rick said at the beginning that this recording will be made available uh, and it will be posted on our website and we will be emailing it out to you tomorrow, so uh, you will be receiving it. We will be updating some of the slides before we send those out. Number two, uh, when the webinar closes, you will be taking to our website where you, uh, we encourage you to please share your stories uh, about the impact of COVID-19 and what it's doing to your organization and communities. Those are very important things for us to be knowing so that when we go to policymakers, we're able to tell your story so they understand how important it is. We don't use individuals or organizations' names without your permission. Uh, and we may want to circle back to you to get that, uh, and you will still be free to say no. Uh, but it certainly makes it more granular and more important uh, when we can do that. So please uh, uh, provide that information and feel free to scroll up the page uh, to uh, look at other resources that are available. Um, and then finally, as uh, Donna said, um, this is a nationwide network. Uh, we need your voices. We need your shoulder to help push with everybody else to secure uh, advocacy, lobbying victories, so nonprofits are not left out of these solutions. We need to have a seat at the table because we're closest to the problems which means that we are closest to the solutions, but that only happens when we are all operating together. So please join your state association of nonprofits. Uh, and finally, please, please don't be a carrier. Uh, take care of yourself. Uh, take care of those closest to you. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Be well. Do good. Thank you all very much. Uh, and stay tuned to our website where we will continue to post things for you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.